Hello, everyone. This week, I'd like to share a presentation I prepared called Exploring Family Search. We're going to take a look at the Latter day Saints Family Search website and find out how to do a record search, how to search the catalog. We're going to look at some of the online courses that are available. We're going to find out how to use the Family Search Research Wiki, and we're going to look at how to submit an online request form. Let's get started. For those of you who don't know me, I've been researching for more than 45 years. I'm based in British Columbia, Canada, and since the ancestors I am researching lived in Turkey, Germany, and England, regular visits to those local archives is not really an option. But I have made many trips over the years to the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, and I've taken full advantage of their collection of millions of rolls of microfilm and books. As I mentioned, my ancestors traveled a lot. And in fact, that's what first got me interested in genealogy. The picture in the bottom left of the screen is my grandmother and me. She was born in Constantinople, Turkey, which I thought was very exotic. And that's what started me on what has turned out to be a lifelong genealogy journey. I have 24 years experience in the computer industry and another 18 years as a private tutor. So those two careers have given me a very useful combination of skills that I've been able to apply to my genealogy activities. You will notice in this presentation that I have screen captures from both the Family Search and Ancestry websites. Obviously, the copyright for those images rests with Family Search and Ancestry, but I'm using them here for education and demonstration purposes only. I would appreciate it if you do not copy, download, or share any of my family photos without my permission. I have used photos from my personal collection throughout this presentation. After all, the presentation is called family search. So I thought it only appropriate to share with you some of my family images. So let's look at what we're going to talk about. We're going to go over how to navigate the website. We'll talk about searching the records, searching the catalog, and what I like to call the hidden extras. So first, let's take a look at the family search main menus. We have at the top our main menu and there's a family tree menu which gives you access to all the commands to set up your family tree much like on Ancestry or Find My Past or My Heritage. One thing to keep in mind however is that Family Search does not have the concept of personal trees that are just yours. When you submit entries, you are submitting your information to one global tree. So that means that somebody else who feels they have the next piece in your genealogical puzzle could add information to your portion of the tree. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, the search menu is where we will be spending most of our focus today. And I find this is the menu I'm going into frequently. We're going to talk about searching records, searching the catalog, and we're going to take a look at something called the research wiki. The memories menu is another option that allows you to share information about your family. The Get Involved menu provides information on 
indexing projects that you may want to volunteer to help with. And the last menu, Activities, has various fun game-like activities that you may want to do with other family members. So that's the overview of the menus. So now that we know what the main menus contain, let's take a look at how you would actually do a search by name. You would go to the search menu, click records, and you will see this data entry screen. Let's say I wanted to see what family search had on my ancestor, James Edward Renton. I would type in the name. And for now, I won't specify any other options, but if I click this more options, you'll notice there's quite a bit more that I could specify. But I'll just click search. And I will get a screen that looks like this. Now you notice we have 69,990 results. And it's 245 pages of information. And just taking a look, we've got items from the United States. We've got England. Um, Australia. Now I can see some of these entries are definitely the ones I want. My ancestor was in Leeds. So what I'm going to do now is go over to this panel on the right and I'm going to narrow the search down a bit. So I'm going to put in a place. I'll put Leeds. Yorkshire, and I will click search again. Now we're down to 3,000 entries. Let's match the first name exactly. We're now down to 13 records. If you notice a typical entry, it has the name. It tells you the type of event, and you might have something listed under this relationships column. Then we have a few other symbols. If we hover over, there is a link to a tree that somebody has submitted where James Edward Renton is listed. And this census record has been linked to that tree, which is why that symbol is showing up. If I want to view the details of the actual census entry, that's this document symbol. So if I click that, it's going to bring me to this detail screen with the transcript of the entry. And it's also got the citation information here. So that is one way of looking at the details, but another way that I find handy is I could click on the name on the left hand side here and you'll notice now I have a panel on the right that I can scroll through to see all of that record details. So this is the same information that was in the full screen display, but the advantage by browsing this way, there's a little right arrow here. I can click that. Now I'm looking at the next entry. This is actually this second entry on the screen. And if I click again, I'm now looking at this third entry. So I can actually scroll through all of the results and quickly see which one might be the entry I want 
The only downside is it does not update on your display on the left which record you are actually on. Let's say I wanted to look just at the death records. I could have specified death date as part of my search, but since I kept it general just to see everything they would have for James Edward Renton, I can now filter on some of these events that are up top here. So if I click, for example, on death, I've got some choices. I could filter by death place. I could filter by death year. So in my case, I'm going to select the filter criteria, which is United Kingdom and Ireland. So it's now checked and I'm going to apply. So it now shows up at the top here that I have a death filter applied and you can see that I'm now looking at the three records to do with death. So we've got the death registration entries and we've got a burial entry. And if I cancel that particular filter by just clicking this X, I'm back to my same 13 results. I could go to a full screen display for this. I could get rid of this little side panel by just clicking the X. Let me just close it down. And I'm now at a full screen mode, so there's more room to see this detailed list. If I want to bring that side panel back, I just click search. Now I mentioned that there are other search criteria. So for example, I could have specified parent's name. I could have said, the father was John. And if I wanted to say, do an exact search, and I search again, notice how the display changed. Just by putting exact, I am saying the record has to match this information exactly. So the only record I'm going to get is where the father's name is listed and it exactly matches that. So you need to be careful when you are applying that exact search criteria. Now you can also use wildcards. So if I'm not finding the information I'm expecting, it could be that the R was mistranscribed as a B or even as a P. I've seen that happen. So quite often, if I'm really not finding what I need, I might put a wild card in and search. And you notice now it's picking up Thornton. Boynton, Stanton, and you can have multiple wild cards. So I could do something like this. In other words, give me every last name that has NT with something else in front and something else behind. And if I search, see I've got Clemenson, Thornton, Tennant, so just be aware that if you are not finding what you want, it's helpful to use wildcards. And I will typically do something like this because I find often it's the vowels that will shift a bit in the spelling.
So some of this depends on how sloppy their handwriting was. Some of it depends on perhaps what their accent was, how the name was heard. I once had one of my Heath ancestors, H-E-A-T-H, -E transcribed as ETH in a census. And it wasn't until I thought to use a wildcard at the very beginning that I realized that's why I couldn't find them. They had dropped the H when they recorded the family name in the census. And it reminded me, we have to be aware of how our ancestors would have spoken and any dialects that would have played a part potentially in the spelling. If we close this down for a minute, and let's get back to the top. Now, something else you can do that's very handy, this preferences button allows you to change the way your search results are displayed. So right now, it's using the fixed table display. You could also switch to data sheet. And the difference is with data sheet, it looks a lot more like an Excel spreadsheet in that they have split the information into many more columns. And if we scroll down our list of results, you notice that the number of results per page is set to 20, but we can change that we can set it to 100. And where this is handy is if you are wanting to look at a large quantity of data. So for instance, I have a rent in one name study, which means I am potentially tracking and recording information on every rent in worldwide. So let's say I wanted to download all of these results into an Excel spreadsheet. I can do that using this preferences button. So I would select data sheet and I do have the option to customize it to decide which columns of information I want to download. But right now I'll just leave it to everything. And I can export it as an Excel spreadsheet or a comma delimited file if I wanted to bring it into some other program. And if I now click export results, it has downloaded those results, 100 results at a time to my uh, computer. And the advantage of using the 100 is if I had, say, 3,000 results that I was trying to download, if I have set my results page to be 100, then I can do my downloads one page at a time. So it's very easy to keep track of which ones I downloaded, which ones I still have to do. So we've learned how to search the records for a particular individual. Let's take a look at how we would search the catalog to find out what information is available for a particular topic or a particular place. So to search the catalog, you go to the search menu at the top here select catalog and you will now see this fill in the blank search form and you'll notice it defaults to a place search but there are other ways you can search for information now if for example we were to search for information on uxbridge and if I click search, we are going to get a list and you can see there are 10 items 
all together. Now, if I was to cancel this place search, so I'll just click the little X here and instead do a keyword search and search on Uxbridge, Ontario and click update. All of a sudden, I have far more entries. I've got 58 entries. So if we look at some of the examples, we have things like the descendants of Robert Dobson, Uxbridge, Ontario, the North American family and descendants of George Metcalf of Uxbridge, Ontario. So my point here is it's worth doing both types of searches, keyword, and place if you are searching for information on a specific place because you may find that you have other material that would be useful that shows up in a keyword search. You can also do a subject search and that is particularly useful either subject or keyword when you have records that you're searching for that are not tied to a specific place. So for example, if we were going to find out about immigration records for Canada, those are not going to be associated necessarily with particular towns. So some of this has to do with the type of information you are searching for. So let's now look at the specifics of a particular film. So if I was to do a keyword search, and I'm going to search on primitive Methodist records for York. And this is a film that I went into previously. So it's giving me 53 results. The one I want is this second entry here. So I would click on it to display the details. What I want to show you is this description area at the bottom. This tells you what your microfilm or digitized images what will be included. We have baptisms from 1843 to 1867. Here is our film number. Here is the digitized image group number. And we have some symbols. The camera symbol means that the images can be viewed. The key means that there are restrictions on the viewing and the restrictions could be either you can't download the image, you can't print the image, or it could be that you can only view the image at a family history library or an affiliate library. This particular entry for the Primitive Methodist Church in Howden, Yorkshire, shows a microfilm symbol. So this would be a microfilm that has not yet been digitized. Again, this is a film that would be at the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. But the magnifying glass means that the information has been at least partially indexed. So you could click the magnifying glass and here is the indexed information from that particular film. So you could put in some search information or you could just literally browse through 245 pages of names to find the entry that you wanted. So here's an example of an entry that has the camera icon, meaning you can browse these images online with no restrictions. You can print the image, you can download it. 
apps. So that means you can view these images from the comfort of your own home. We've talked about how to do a place search, how to do a subject and keyword search. One thing I should mention, you can enter multiple terms into different search fields and they work together. So for example, if I typed leads and I go update, so I'm seeing all the records for leads in Yorkshire. But if I want only the cemetery information, I can see that's a category here, and I've got cemetery indexes here. But if I was to type in cemeteries and click update, I'm now getting all of the records that would have references to cemeteries in Leeds. So it makes sense that some of the church records would be referenced because we have records from the Leeds General Cemetery. And military records, we've got war memorials in the cemeteries. So you can combine your search terms, which can also help to target the particular collections of records, the particular films that you want to access. Now, sometimes if I'm researching from home, I may choose to select the online option so that all I'm going to be shown is the information that is available online. That doesn't mean it's information that I can view from my home, however, because there could be viewing restrictions. So let's take a look now at one of the films in detail. So if I go in to one of these primitive Methodist records, and I'm going to look at one of the images. So let's bring up one of these images here. So there's a few things that you'll notice. The minute I click on a particular image, the image number shows up the top. So I'm looking at image 16 of 996. I can use these next and previous arrows to scroll through the images, just as if I was scrolling through a microfilm. And I have these plus and minus signs, so I can enlarge or shrink the image to zoom in. And if I hold my mouse button down, I can drag that image around so I can really focus in on a particular area of that image. So that's quite handy. Over on tools, I can invert the colors. Sometimes it's easier to make the image out if you invert it to be white on a black background. I can also do some adjustment to the image as far as the brightness, the contrast. And I can rotate the image by just clicking that command. Now, these other symbols are very useful. Sometimes the particular images you want to see might not be the very first item on your microfilm. So if you click this browse multiple images, you get thumbnails 
of all of the images. And this lets you see those separator pages. So here is item one. And here is the page for end of item one. Here is the start of item two. So I can scroll down just using my mouse or I can press page down on my computer to move through the images. So here is item two. So if I was looking for item three, if that was the set of records of images that I wanted to see, this allows me to go to that section of the film. The other way is just to key in an image. So if I figure I need to be about halfway through, I'll put in an image number. So let's say jump to image 400. Then I will go to the thumbnails and see where I am. So this image with the light green box is image 400. That's in section eight. That's item eight. So if I wanted item seven, I know I'm going to have to go back a little bit. Maybe I'll type in image 350 and then look at the thumbnails. There's seven. So jumping around the film is best done by a combination of typing in an explicit image number and guessing where you want to be on the film and using that thumbnail view. So you can toggle between single image, which will bring up whichever image you selected, or thumbnail. And click on an image, click it again to bring it up. So double clicking an image brings it up. The other thing you will notice, we have two tabs at the bottom here. We have something called an image index, and it is basically showing the other items on this image. So that can be handy, especially if you're having difficulty reading some of the handwriting. It is handy to have that transcript down below. And to hide the transcript, because it takes up quite a bit of room, just click the down arrow. And that will give you more space on your screen to view the image. This information tab, if I want to pop that up, it's showing me all of the different categories that were filmed. So we have the Wesleyan Methodist Central Chapel Baptisms, they're item five on this film. The Flaxton Methodist Chapel is item four, James Street, item 10. So it is giving you the list of everything that you'll find on this physical microfilm that you are viewing. And at the top here, they've got film number. It's actually your digital group number. So something else you can do, if you know a film number, this one is 75687398. If we go back to our search screen, we can actually search by a film number, 756-8739. And if I click update, this is giving me that list of all of the chapels, the Methodist chapels that are listed on that particular film. So we've looked at doing a name search and a catalog search, but there are a lot of other functions available that are not obvious from those main menus. So let's take a look at how to access what I call those hidden extras. If you scroll down to the bottom of any page on the Family Search website, you will see some links at the bottom left. And if you click this sitemap link, 
you will see this view of all of the main components of the website. So this is like an alternate menu structure. And this historical records section is where we've been spending most of our time. But there are a number of other useful functions that are not accessible from those main menus or not easily accessible from the main menus at the top of the screen. There is a whole other set of menus accessible through this family history library in Salt Lake City link. And I'm going to click on that. So when you click on that link, you come to the Welcome to the Family History Library main page. And you'll notice in addition to the main menus, we have a second set of menus. These are the menus for the Family History Library functions. And those five topics, collection services, learning resources, visit, research help, are on the page if you just scroll down. So we have the labels at the top here, and we have individual clickable graphic images to also access that same information. And what we are going to focus on for the purposes of this presentation is learning resources and services. So the Salt Lake City Family History Library offers a free scanning service where you can bring in your personal books, photographs, articles, documents, and use their equipment to scan it in for free. And you can then save it to a USB stick or portable hard drive. They offer a similar service to convert those old VCR tapes, CDs, film. All of your media can be converted into digital format again for free. They also offer one on one Zoom based 20 minute research appointments. And the intent here is to discuss with a research specialist options and approaches to perhaps help you break through brick walls that you're encountering. So this is not having someone in Family History Library look up information for you. They also offer a free records lookup service. And we're going to talk about this one in detail. So the records lookup service applies to any films, books, or databases in the Family History Library catalog. You provide specific details of the item you want looked up. You would submit your request by filling in an online form. And as I mentioned, this is not open-ended research. This is not my ancestor lived in Leeds. Um, can you please see what information you have on him? These are specific requests where you are giving dates and asking them just to go and pull that image. This is a typical lookup request. I found this entry on Ancestry. So the transcript on Ancestry shows the name Edgar Herbert Renton. It gives the date of the baptism. It gives the place, the parents' names. And most importantly, Ancestry is kind enough in many cases to include the Family History Library film number. That's what FHL means. So this is the actual film number from the Family History Library catalog. And 
they are giving further reference information, an item number and page that will help with retrieval of this image. So let's take a look at how we would fill out the form. So from that Family History Library page, we would click on the Services menu and select Record Lookup Service. So we're now looking at the Family Search web page for the Record Lookup Service. And one thing you're going to want to check is to make sure that you are signed into the website. So right now, I'm not, so I'm going to sign in. And now it's confirming I am signed into the website. For some of these functions, there is a difference in what you can access if you are signed in versus if you're not signed in. So it's always worth double checking. We scroll down the screen and we click this green request lookup button. And what we are seeing now is the form that you fill out and submit online. So we're going to type in our information. So I'd type in my name. And my email address. And let me scroll down a bit. And it asks you to confirm your email address. So we type it in again. And I'll just put in a pretend phone number. OK. And it asks what we are requesting, because you can get them to look up information in a book. You can ask for an image from a digitized or non-digitized film. You can also request an image from one of their CD-ROM databases. So most of the time I find I'm requesting an actual image from one of the microfilms. And then I would click Next. So that first page is basically your general information about who is submitting the request and what exactly you are requesting. Now we're getting into the details of the request itself. And you notice the first thing it's asking me for is the film number. Now, if we take a look at that Ancestry transcript, it did give us the Family History Library film number, and it gave us the item number and the page. But you're not always going to have that information depending on what website you might have gone to and found your clues. You may have gone directly to Family Search and looked in the catalog. And that's what we're going to do right now. So if I go to Family Search and I'm going to do Catalog Search, and I'm going to do a place search for Layton Stone, which is where this particular parish register would be. And I'm looking for church records. And I want the registers for St. John the Baptist's church. And that's the range of years I need. And when I scroll down, I need to take a look at this entry here. And this is my film number, 1564140. It says items three to five, meaning the year range of 1833 to 1891 has been broken down into three separate grouped 
filmings and there'll be a separator um, page between each group. If I didn't have the ancestry transcription confirming my image within item five, I would put the complete range so that the family search staff know that potentially they might have to check through all three of those um, ranges to find the correct sequence of years. And this is my image group number. So what I like to do is copy that information and I'm going to paste it right in to the form. So I identify this as the Family History Library film. And I'll just put a comma there. Items three to five. And then I'll go DGS number. Just so that they've got that information as well. And in this case, I do know that it's item five that contains my image because we saw that information on this ancestry transcript. It's telling me the film number and the item number. Now, we don't know the image number and by image number, they mean the digital image in that film. We don't know that, so we leave it blank. We don't have a direct link to the image, so we leave that blank. Date of record, September 16th, 1888. The name I'm going to put the child is Edgar Herbert Renton, and I'll put the surname in capital letters. And then I'm going to put the parents' names. Joseph Smith Renton and Mary Elizabeth Renton. So the idea here is you're putting in the other information that is likely on that record that you were requesting, just so that when the family search staff are looking through the register, they can make a match to the entry you are looking for. Now, name of the country they lived in. The country is England, the town, city, or state. We'll type that in. And I am requesting a baptismal record. Now, this is where I can put in any additional information to help them find the record. So, I would put, I have a transcript stating the baptism took place at St. John the Baptist Church in Leightonston. The ancestry transcript says Film 1564140, reference ID item 5, page 224. So I've now given them the actual page number reference from the ancestry transcript just to make sure I'm giving them all possible information to help them find this image. Now, in this particular case, I'd actually checked on another website, Find My Past, and they were showing a different year for the 
baptism. They were showing 1889 shows the baptism year is 1889, not 1888. Not sure which year is the correct one. Um, September 16th date is the same in both transcripts. So again, when I submit this, the person receiving this request will know that it's either going to be September 16th in 1888 or September 16th, 1889. So it's cutting down on their work to find this image. I would then click Next. And now I'm just asked to agree to their policies and I would click submit to submit the request, which I'm not going to do right now since this is just for demonstration purposes. So shortly after I submitted the form, I received a confirmation email from the Family History Library. And this is what it would look like, just confirming the details of what I had submitted. And you'll notice at the top, it says that I will get a response in one to four weeks. Usually I find the response is a matter of days, but again, it depends on how busy they are as to how long it will take. Also, it depends on how much detail you can give them to make it easy for them to retrieve that image. And here is the image that I received back and there's my ancestors entry. So we've taken a look at the services offered. Let's now talk about the learning resources. So there are more than 1300 classes and webinars available that you can view from the comfort of your home. There are also multi-lesson courses that you can view from home. You can also look at more than 3,800 videos from Roots Tech conferences. And as you can see at this moment, you can view Roots Tech conference presentations all the way back to 2019. And the other piece of the learning resources is this thing called the Research Wiki. And think of it as Family Search Online Help. So let's take a look at some of these learning resources. So from the Family History Library page, we would select Learning Resources and scroll down to see our options. Now, I do have another video that goes into detail on the Roots Tech videos and the live classes and webinars. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but I would like to show you the Learning Center and the Research Wiki. So let's go in to the Learning Center. You can use this search field to access any of the live classes and webinars or the multi-lesson courses that are on this particular screen. So for example, if we look briefly back at the learning resources. There's a box here for live classes and webinars. That information can be accessed by searching in this particular search field. So if I wanted to find out about Australia BMD and I press search, it's giving me a link here and let's say I like the look of this course. So here's the course 
I can play it at any point. But just to point out, if I was to go back and now look at the live classes and webinars, if I was to click that section, and if I look at the list of all classes. So I'm going to sort this list by country and scroll down until I find Australia. So here are the Australian courses. You notice there's this one, Australia BDM Civil Registration Index. If I click that link, it is the same course that I just accessed from the search box. So if we go back to this learning center, think of it as your learning hub. And if we click on one of these multi-lesson courses, and just a note, when you're clicking on these um, images, you have to click on the picture, not on the text. So you'll notice at the right, we have the list of all of the lessons in this particular course on the research process. And this particular course has 48 lessons. And there is a course information sheet. And if we click on one of the other lessons to bring up that video, so let's click on this one, conducting the reference interview. You'll see that there are different handouts. So that gives you some idea of the type of information that you can find in the Learning Center. We'll briefly look at the Roots Tech videos right now they are setting up this information page in preparation for Roots Tech 2023. But if you click this on-demand link at the top of the screen, that is your access to the conference talks from prior years. And if we scroll down, if we click the year, you have access to talks from 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022. And I'm going to click View Full Catalog. There are 3,810 talks that you can access. There is a search field, so I could type in DNA and see what talks there were. We've got 281 talks to choose from. Now let's take a look at the research wiki. Think of the research wiki just like Wikipedia. This is Family Search Online Help. It has how-to procedures, background information on anything and everything to do with genealogy. You could start by searching for a place. You could click this list of localities and say, give me information on researching in Ontario. And it will take you to a page with links and information on how to get started with Ontario Research. It has information on the right of all different topics. It's got background information. It's got local research resources. It has information on the historical counties and districts, migration routes, etc. So these pages are a really good start when you are having to research somewhere new. The other thing you can do is search by subject. So I could say 
give me information about Yorkshire probate records. So it tells me all about some of the different courts, the indexes that are available, how to identify the jurisdictions by parish, other explanatory information. And I could look up a particular parish. I could type in Adel. What's nice is it's going to show me the coverage for a lot of the common websites. So this is telling me that Family Search has indexes and images for the baptisms from 1500s to 1900s. It's got indexes and images for the marriages and the burials all for the same period. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to download the handout. You'll find the links in the video description at the bottom of your screen. You may have to click more to see the handout links. Thanks for watching.